First, I'd like to thank the faculty lecture committee for inviting me to share some of my recent research, and thank you all for coming. I'm going to be presenting some new work today that builds on ideas I developed in my recent book, but looks at new materials and in part stretches forward into a later period. In early September in the year 712, Li Longji, who would be known to history as the Emperor Xuanzong of the Tang Dynasty, took the throne to begin what would be an almost 40-year reign, during which the Tang reached new heights of cultural, military, and economic achievement before falling almost completely apart in the rebellion of a Sogdian general named An Lushan. At some point during Xuanzong's reign, a man named Li Bai wrote a poem today known by the title, Jiang Jinjo, Bring in the Ale. Or maybe he simply declaimed it aloud while someone else wrote it down. Or maybe he only wrote a poem somewhat like it. We really don't know. Li Bai would eventually become one of the two or three best known poets in all of Chinese history. But much of his background is a mystery. Like the Emperor Xuanzong and the Tang royal family, at least some of his recent ancestors were likely Central Asians who spoke a form of Turkish. Li Bai's father was apparently a traveling merchant, but this didn't stop the son from claiming to be a close relative of the royal family with whom he shared a surname. Of course, Li Bai's father quite probably decided he would adopt that surname because it was the same as that of the royal family. Still, Li Bai liked to address younger members of the royal house as cousins, much to their surprise and perhaps amusement. The poem I'm going to talk about, Bring in the Ale, in the version most commonly read today, goes something like this. Haven't you seen how the waters of the Yellow River come down from heaven, rushing in their flow to the sea, never turning back again? Haven't you seen how in the bright mirrors of mighty halls they grieve over whitened hair, at dawn like strands of blue-black silk, at twilight turned to snow? For satisfaction in this life, take pleasure to the limit, and never let a goblet of gold face the bright moon empty. Heaven gave birth to my talents, they must be put to use. I toss away a thousand in gold, it comes right back to me. So boil a sheep, butcher an ox, make merry for a while. And in one sitting you must down three hundred cups. Hey, Master Tsun, ho, Dan Cho, bring in the ale and don't you stop. I'll sing you a song. I pray you bend me your ears and heed. Bells and cauldrons, fine foods and jade, it's not these that I prize. All I want is to stay dead drunk, no use to sober up. The sages and worthies of ancient days now all lie silent, and only the greatest drinkers have a fame that lingers on. Once long ago, the Prince of Chun held a party in the Pingla Lodge. A gallon of ale cost 10,000 cash, all the joy and laughter they pleased. So you, my host, how can you say you're short on cash? Go right out, buy us some ale, and I'll do the pouring for you. Then take my dappled horse, take my furs worth a fortune. Just call the boy to take them and trade them for fine ale. And here together, we'll melt the sorrows of all eternity. This poem played a part, a small but important part, in the process of forming Li Bai's poetic identity. It has a long-standing and secure place in the canon and is seen as clear evidence of Li Bai's boisterous and spontaneous personality. But this security and the critical confidence that underlies it obscures a much more complex and variable reality, the reality of how poems in Li Bai's era actually circulated and changed in the process of that circulation. Today I'd like to use this poem as the center of an argument about how the material aspects of how poetry was encountered in Tang China could influence the meaning of that poetry and how attitudes towards poetry changed between the Tang and succeeding periods. It's become a commonplace to observe that in this age of digital reproduction, documents proliferate in ways never before seen. Indeed, without moving more than a few feet from my desk, I can experience Tang Dynasty poetry in a surprisingly wide array of forms and formats, 
from reprints of 11th and 12th century printed editions and modern typeset critical editions to searchable databases and high resolution photographs of Tang period manuscripts. <laughs> oh, Mr. Jobs. <laughs> Mr. Jobs, Mr. Jobs, you have to interrupt my talk. Okay. <laughs> Oddly appropriate as I'm talking about poems I can find <laughs> on the internet. I can listen to Tang poems chanted and sung with a variety of pronunciations, including some purporting to reproduce those of the Tang period itself. I can buy any number of products, from t-shirts to pencil cases, with Tang poems inscribed on their surfaces. Much as this proliferation of textual forms might seem a unique modern phenomenon, it is so only degree, oh sorry, only in degree, not in kind. The Tang itself saw poems chanted and sung in contexts ranging from drunken parties to funerals. And there were few types of surfaces, from temple walls to the naked limbs of courtesans that were not at some point inscribed with a poem. Well, we perhaps take it for granted that the experience of reading a Tang poem written on a t-shirt is going to be different from reading it in an annotated 12th century woodblock print. Scholarship on Tang poetry, whether modern or traditional, has rarely examined the effect that the different material contexts in which readers in earlier periods encountered a poem might have had on the meanings that poem would convey. To some extent, this and a larger tendency to ignore material issues in Tang poetry is understandable. We simply don't have that much physical literary material that survives from the Tang. Like medieval European literature, written poetry in the Tang was typically produced and circulated by means of handwritten manuscripts. The primary material used by Tang authors and scribes, however, was not the expensive but durable parchment and vellum used in Europe, but rather paper. Paper has a very long history in China. Scholars are in general agreement that it was invented there by the second century BC. The earliest surviving documents written on paper date from the second century AD, though there are accounts of its use in writing about a century earlier. By the time we get to the fourth century, paper was the dominant material for written texts in China. The early invention and use of paper, a medium far cheaper and easier to produce than parchment or vellum, meant that literacy and literary production were widespread by the Tang Dynasty. Woodblock printing in succeeding periods further ensured that scholars studying the Tang today would enjoy access to a great number and variety of sources passed down through successive generations of printing. Unfortunately, paper is also fragile, and only a relatively small number of physical texts that were actually copied in the Tang itself have survived to the present day. Yet we are not entirely adrift in a sea of later printed editions. Tang manuscripts do exist. Thanks to the well-known finds in and around the city of Dunhuang in northwest China. Briefly, somewhere near the turn of the 20th century and no later than about 1900, either a Taoist monk named Wang Yuan Lu or his assistant noticed a crack in the wall of one of the temple caves in the Mogao Temple Cave Complex at Dunhuang. Behind this wall, he discovered a massive stash of stacked manuscripts. The bulk of these eventually found their way into the hands of the British archaeologist Mark Oral Stein and the French scholar Paul Pelliot in the early 20th century and later into the collections of the British Museum and the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Examination of the manuscripts eventually revealed a date range of 406 to 995 AD, along with evidence that the caves were sealed in 1035 or 1036. The total number of these Dunhuang manuscripts, including numerous fragments, is now thought to be about 50,000. While most of the manuscripts consist of copies of known Buddhist scriptures, there are also significant numbers of such works as popular narratives and vernacular poetry and prose that have changed the way the development of those genres is now viewed. Moreover, because many of the, uh, many of the poems and uh, other literary documents were written on the back of what appears to be discarded government documents, 
scholars have been able to reconstruct important pieces of legal codes, housing registers, and the like. Now, in addition to all of this, the vernacular literature and the government documents, there's a small number of works belonging to what we would consider the high literary culture of the Tang by such poets as Wang Wei, Li Bai, Bai Jui, Gao Shi, and others. The importance of these Dunhuang finds to scholars of Tang poetry became apparent soon after their discovery. However, serious work on the full corpus of Tang poetry from Dunhuang didn't begin in earnest until many years later when the text became available in photo reproduced form to scholars in Taiwan, China, and Japan. That is, to scholars who could actually read them at the time. They sat for a long time in the British Museum with people looking at them occasionally, but very rarely were these people who could actually read the text and figure out what they were. Another possible reason why scholars of Tang poetry have tended to avoid material questions is because to assert the different material contexts can create different meanings for a given work presents a challenge to some of the most fundamental notions of how to read and interpret Tang poetry. If a proliferation of forms entails a proliferation of meanings, the basic notion that there is a single authorized meaning that, quote, speaks what is intently on the mind as the first century great preface to the classic of poetry, one of the foundational texts of Chinese literary theory has it, becomes problematic. Now, recent scholarship on medieval and Renaissance European literature has largely embraced the idea that material contexts are a key aspect of meaning and interpretations. Roger Chartier proposes, quote, if we want to understand the appropriations and interpretations of a text in their full historicity, we need to identify the effect in terms of meaning that its material forms produced. David Caston, speaking of the works of Shakespeare, notes that, quote, literature exists in any useful sense only and always in its materializations. These are the conditions of its meaning rather than merely the containers of it. With these notions in mind, I will today examine four different early documents. Three manuscripts from Dunhuang and one printed edition dated to the 11th or 12th century that include texts of Bring in the Wine. My discussion today is going to deal with three different levels, those of document, text, and meaning. And in particular, how the first two levels, document and text, impact our understanding of the third, of meaning. It's my contention that the interpretation of Levi's poem is indeed affected by differences on the level of document and text. And furthermore, that this presents challenges to the common, traditional, and modern critical approaches to this poem, and by extension to many other poems from the Tang period. Now, because of the ubiquity and vagueness of such terms as text and work, both of which I've already used in writings on literature, it's important to be clear about the meanings I'm using here. Following Peter Schillingsberg, I use the more general term, work, to refer to, quote, the imagined whole implied by all differing forms of a text which we conceive as representing a single literary creation. The assumption that there is a poem composed by Levi that appears under a variety of titles, or sometimes lack of titles, is the starting point for this discussion. That does not mean that this work ultimately has one perfect and unchanging correct form that we can somehow recover or discover. Rather, the work that underlies our discussion is a more amorphous concept that includes different texts, but is not limited by any one of them. A text, on the other hand, in the way I'm using it, can be pinned down. This term indicates the actual order of words and punctuation as contained in any one physical form, such as a manuscript, a proof, or a book. A single text can exist in a number of forms. It can be manifest in both a manuscript and a printed edition. It can reside in someone's memory. It can be spoken aloud at a particular time. As Schillingsberg notes, Particular physical forms may contain and stabilize a text, but that text is not those forms themselves. I'm here concerned with four different texts of a poetic work by Levi, yet as we'll see, two of these texts are almost identical and thus very close to being a single text 
in spite of being in very different documents. Now, physical uh, textual similarities notwithstanding, the four objects of analysis here differ substantially on the documentary level. By document here, I mean the physical material, the paper and ink bearing the configuration of signs that represent a text. Document is the only one of these terms that always refers to something with a unique material existence. A single text could be found in numerous separate documents, as is common in print cultures. In manuscript transmission, it's far more common that every new document, that is, every new reproduction, contains a new text that varies in some, later, uh, some greater or lesser degree from the text that served as its source. I'm going to go a little further here and include a notion of what I call documentary context. This refers to the aspects of a given document beyond the paper and ink, such as the texts of other works that, that are included in it, illustrations, marginal notations, authorial attributions, and organization. So what might this poem have looked like in written form to people closer to the period of its composition? Let's take a look at some of the documents. This is an undated Dunhuang manuscript that I'm going to call A here, so I don't have to keep saying Pelio 2544. Um, it's in scroll form. This is obviously just a piece of it. It's part of a much larger scroll. And it's written with a brush. The scroll contains 13 poems in all, some of which are given titles, but only one of which lists an author. The poem we know as Bringing in the Wine um, is identified by neither a title nor an author. It's just there adrift in the sea of other poems. All right, moving on to the next manuscript, which you can see looks very different. This is uh, what I'm going to call B, an undated manuscript, which is also in scroll form and appears on the verso, the reverse side of the classic of poetry that I mentioned a moment ago. We might think of this almost as the rough equivalent of having copied a bunch of contemporary poems on the back cover of your copy of Homer. It appears to be the same collection of poems altogether that we find in manuscript A, though here there are 17 poems in all, some of which are identified by titles, but none of which name authors. Bring in the wine is right there, and once again, it is identified neither by title nor by author. All right, now on to manuscript C, which is also from Dunhuang, is in scroll form, and can actually be dated to about 793 based on a date on the back. The writing is done, and you might notice this difference, with a Tibetan-style wooden pen. So instead of being written with a brush, it's written with a wooden pen. In a practiced and very clear hand. Now, this scroll has 119 poems in all. There appears to be missing sections at the beginning and the end. In fact, it's the largest poetry collection we have from Dunhuang. All of the poems in this are given titles, but only some actually include an author. Interestingly, the poem we know as Bring in the Ale is here given a different title, Shi Zong Kong, Alas, the Goblet is Empty. And you can see there's the poem, and there's its different title right there. It appears near the end of 37 consecutive poems by Li Bai in a section entitled Old Music Bureau Poems. All of the poems by Li Bai are given titles, but he's never identified as the author of any of them. Okay, now we're going to jump ahead in time just a couple hundred years to the Song Dynasty woodblock print. This uh, woodblock print is dated to the Northern Song, the 11th or 12th centuries, and is the earliest extant collection of Li Bai's works. It's in booklet form rather than scroll form, 30 chapters long. It includes a table of contents and begins with extensive prefatory and biographical material from the Tang and Northern Song about Li Bai and about his various literary collections. Bring in the Ale is here given that title. You can see the title at the edge there, right there. Though the text includes the alternative title, Shi Kong Zunjo, Alas, an Empty Goblet of Ale. And you can see that it's right, the alternative title is right under that red box, and I'll explain the red box in a minute. 
In addition to the text of bring in the ale, the document also includes interlineal annotations that indicate variants found in other texts of the work. These are indicated by the term itzuo, which is what I have there in the box. Itzuo means roughly one version has it, or another version has it. And you can see right here, see we have a column of big characters that fill the whole column, and then underneath it we have smaller characters uh, about half the size. Those are the interlineal commentaries that talk about alternative wordings for some of these lines. There's much that could be said about the differences to be found here on the level of document. These are clearly very different physical instantiations of bring in the ale. Just among the Dunhuang manuscripts, we find very different handwriting, different works on the verso sides, and different documentary contexts for the poem. The contrast between these manuscripts and the Song printed edition are even more striking, with only the printed edition identifying the poem as being by Li Bai and placing it in a large and seemingly comprehensive collection of Li Bai's poems, identified as such, organized by genre, and introduced by information about the poet and previous collections of his works. I'll discuss the significance of these differences later on. First, I'd like to turn to variation on the textual level. There are many good reasons to look at textual variation in this period. Variants tell a story, or rather many stories, about how poems change as they move through time and space. They give indications of what different modes of transmission poems might have experienced. The particular variants chosen by editors in different periods can tell us about the poetic tastes of those times. Variants also remind us about the instability of text. They prod us into keeping in mind that the works we read have a history, almost always convoluted, full of contingencies, and in many cases replete with gaps. I've categorized the variation between these four texts into eight different types. There's not enough time today to go through the descriptions of each type, so I'll simply note for now that they range from different forms of the same character. Um, these are not that different from the differences between modern simplified characters and complex characters, or in a not terribly good analogy, the differences between British and American spelling of the same word. So people reading it at the time period would read these two different characters as indicating the same word. In other cases, we have whole lines that are present in one version but missing in another, or lines with very different wording for similar lines. Variants based on phonological or orthographic similarity are frequent. There are a lot of variants where the two different characters look similar or uh, indicate words that sound very similar. In terms of overall variation between the different texts, manuscript A and B are strikingly, almost bizarrely identical on the textual level, with the only real variation being a single example of two reversed characters. And not only is there only one example, but the scribe or someone reading the manuscript later has actually corrected it with a little mark indicating, you know, the equivalent of something like that, indicating that these two characters were accidentally reversed. This exceedingly low rate of variation, two character positions out of 166, essentially amounting, since they're reverse characters, both characters are there, to a single instance of variation and one that's corrected, is a strong indication that these texts may well have had a common source text in their not so distant past. They even share content that seems to be clearly in error. For example, writing the surname of one of Levi's friends incorrectly but incorrectly in the same way in both of these texts. It's very unusual for even different copies of eight-line regulated poems, which have far more built-in mechanisms to assist memorization and transmission, to have such a low rate of variation in this period. So we can essentially think of A and B as a single text for, the, uh, for purposes of comparison here. When we compare them to the text in C, we get an overall variation rate of about 21%. That is 36 out of 168 possible character positions. In other words, we find variation in at least one out of every, char every five character positions in these texts. 
This can be considered a very high rate of variation. Indeed, it's the highest rate of variation I've ever seen between two Tang manuscript copies of a poem. But even this, the, the rate of variation between these manuscripts, pales in comparison to the rate of variation between the Dunhuang versions and the Song printed edition. The early Song edition of Li Bai's collection contains the text, so that's what we're looking at right here, that has formed the basis for all modern editions of his work. And the version of Bring in the Wine that's contained in the main body here, as opposed to the interlineal notes, has provided the specific wording that has been the object of critical attention for both traditional and modern scholars from about the period when this, when this version was, was published in the 11th or 12th century. As we'll see, however, some of the lines that are taken as most emblematic of this poem through history, and indeed of Li Bai himself, either do not appear at all in the earlier Dunhuang text or appear in very different forms. This opens up the real possibility that many Tang readers experience texts of this work that are crucially different from that which formed our understanding of the poem and, to a more limited degree, its author. It's clear that the Song printed edition is much closer to one of the two basic Dunhuang texts than the other. It differs from the text of the poem found in C at a rate of about uh, 19%. So this is less than the variation between the two manuscripts, but still fairly high. The differences between the Song edition and the text found in A and B, however, is much, much greater. The variation comes in at about 33% of the possible character positions, or a full third of the poem. And when we look at the specific instances of variation, the significance of these percentages becomes clear. I've noted that the title, Bring in the Ale, and is not supplied. This title doesn't appear in any of the manuscript versions of the poem. There's a related line that sounds very similar, reading, bring in the ale and don't you stop, which appears in the Song printed edition, but is nowhere to be found in any of the Dunhuang manuscript texts. It's not that these other versions have similar lines or a character or two with different radicals, but rather the line is not there at all in the earlier texts. The most striking example of variation is found in the line that has come to be seen as most representative of not only this poem as a whole, but its author's personality speaking through the poem as well. The Song edition line, Tian sheng wo cai bi you yong. Heaven gave birth to my talents, they must be put to use. Plays a disproportionate part in most critical discussions of this poem. And it appears in very different versions in the Dunhuang texts. Let's see, so in version C we have, and remember version C is closer to the Song edition in most cases. The equivalent line is, heaven gives birth to my kind, I have outstanding talents. And then in version A and B we have, heaven gave birth to my timber, I have outstanding talents. I'll discuss this line further in a minute. There's much to be gained by analyzing Bring in the Wine on the levels of document and text. Documents give us access to components of the physical and the psychological aspects of reading experiences that people had some thousand or more years ago. Textual variants can tell us about the paths by which a work circulated and give us indications of both how and why circulation resulted in textual change. At the same time, as scholars of literature, we do not typically examine poetry for the sake of evaluating handwriting or simply noting textual differences. We read poems for their meaning. Insights on the level of document and text are substantially more interesting if they have an impact on what readers think the poem means. In this final section, I'll now look at how the textual and documentary levels of this work influence how readers understand and might have understood it. On the documentary level, we see how these three manuscripts from Dunhuang differ from one another in physical terms. I'm not going to go as far as to say that the fact that A and B are written with a brush and C is written with a wooden pen results in any real differences in meaning. The fuller documentary context, however, clearly does influence how the work might be interpreted. The four documents we've examined here provide substantially different interpretive indications through their documentary context. At one end of the spectrum, we have A and B, in which Bring in the Wine appears in a collection of poems 
by a number of different authors, only some of whom are identified. Moreover, there's nothing connecting the poem to Levi himself. In each document, the poem has no title, no indication of author, and is in a set of other poems that, as far as we know, are not by Levi himself. In B, this collection of poems is further marginalized by appearing on the back of a much more formal and carefully copied text of a classical work, the classic of poetry. Now, turning to our third Dunhuang manuscript, C, we also find a collection of diverse poems and no direct authorial attribution. At the same time, Bring in the Wine is here surrounded by other poems that we do know to be the work of Levi. It's given a title, and it's categorized by genre. It's certainly more likely that a reader would recognize this group of poems as being by Levi than that he would identify a single isolated work as being his. Designating the poem as belonging to the old music bureau genre also gives further indications to a reader about how he might interpret the work. Finally, we have the full interpretive structure of the Song printed edition, with its authorial attributions, categories, prefaces, biographical information, and annotations. This clearly provides the reader with the most guidance, and thus has the most impact on how the reader interprets the work. Here, interlineal commentary, though limited to citations of variants found in other texts, identifies this particular text as the object of scholarly consideration. It is authorized. And even if this authorization does not derive directly from the author himself, the implication is that the other hands involved are presenting what they see as the text of the poem as he intended it. The claim of authority and authorship is important. In a literary culture in which many genres of poetry were considered to be highly autobiographical, the biography of the author is a key component in determining meaning and interpretation. All these elements of the documentary context, placement, authorship, title, and genre, have a part to play in how any reader in the time would interpret the work. Now, if we turn to the level of text, though many of the differences between these different texts do not directly affect meaning, others do. This is especially clear in the differences between the Dunhuang texts and the Song edition, and by extension, in the editions that we typically read today. The nature of these differences is also such that they cannot be written off simply to scribal error. At some point in the first few centuries of, that this poem circulated, someone decided that it would be improved by adding or removing the line, bring in the ale and don't you stop. It's possible that the line could have been accidentally skipped, but the fact that it's missing in all of the Dunhuang manuscripts makes such a claim more suspect. A number of the differences between these texts of the poem also deal with themes that are closely tied to common notions of Levi's literary and personal identity. It's intriguing that a line about bringing in the ale without cease and a very similar title appear only in a later text attributed to an author who became known for his love of drink. The most interesting example in terms of its relevance to critical approaches to the poem is the line that reads here, heaven gave birth to my talents, they must be put to use in the Sung edition. It's unquestionably the best known line in the entire poem. Indeed, some critical readings give the impression that the entire poem functions as a frame for this one line. One Chinese critic writes that the line is, quote, a declaration of the value of life, emblematic of Li Bai's hope for the future. Another dates the poem to the 24th year of the Kaiyuan reign period, 737, based on the assumption that the poem must have been written in the early Kaiyuan period because the line, heaven gave birth to my talents, they must be put to use, and the word use in particular would have been impossible for Li Bai in the later Tianbao reign period because by that point he would have lost faith in Emperor Xuanzong's leadership and would no longer believe that his uh, his talents could be put to use. The logic here is that the hope that his talents could be put to use could only have existed in an earlier time. So you can see the kind of close reading that traditional critics often give these poems. The attraction of this line as it appears in the Sung edition is obvious. It fits nicely with the general notion of Levi as a poet who presents himself with unbridled enthusiasm and confidence. 
that his talents must be put to use, bespeaks an almost uncontrollable spontaneity, talent that spills out as the waters of the Yellow River fall from heaven, rushing to the sea without return, as the opening of the poem has it. It's also the most unequivocal description of the self in the work, with the first person pronoun declaring that this line is about the poet himself. There's no question that these different versions of this crucial line result in different understandings of how to interpret the poem. And there are real problems here for criticism that is strongly dependent on biography and close reading. Perhaps most problematic is the idea that the iconic line from this Song edition text is not by Levi at all, but is rather a result of changes in the text of this work over time. As Levi's fame and reputation evolved and did so in a particular direction, it would not be surprising if copyists and editors made slight wording changes to make the poem sound more like what they felt Levi would write, or even what he should write. Evidence that copyists, editors, and poets themselves in the Tong regularly made such changes is both abundant and clear in numerous contexts. The fact that so much of the variation between the Sung edition and the manuscripts touches on themes that came to be emblematic of Levi's poetic and personal image is, if ultimately inconclusive, provocative nonetheless. Under this scenario, textual variation and biographically based interpretive modes would work together, resulting in texts that increasingly correspond to the critical image of a given author, an image that in turn is molded by these new texts. We cannot be sure to what degree such a cycle is at work in the present case. What is clear is that in the period from Levi's life through the Northern Song, there were already texts of Bring in the Ale that differed substantially, and that these differences could indeed result in different understandings of the poem. The comparison between the Song printed edition and the three Dunhuang manuscripts further demonstrates how in certain ways Early printed editions were closely related to their manuscript forebears, while in others they represent a meaningful divide between two very different literary cultures. Printing clearly does not bring an end to the introduction of textual variants. A given set of printing blocks could be used to create many different individual documents, all of which contain the same text. But Different song printings were based on different manuscript copies and thus reproduced the variants that those manuscript copies contained. Moreover, because new printing blocks were typically produced by copying out a fresh manuscript and pasting it on the back of printing blocks that then would be carved, every, uh, every new manuscript, sorry, every new printing block is an opportunity for new manuscript variations to creep in. Thus, in material terms, printing was never that far removed from the manuscript culture that preceded it, and indeed still flourished alongside it for the rest of the imperial period. Printing altered the manner in which textual variants spread, but did not bring that spread to a halt. In terms of documentary context and the attitude towards poetic literature that that context implies, the Song, however, represented a sea change. The use of interlineal comments that one version has it, Yitzuo, of which there are 11 in this case. There's uh, one of the examples. Again, you can see the larger characters of the authorized text and then notes about the variation right there. This is a clear indication that Tang poetry had become the object of scholarly attention. To the best of my knowledge, there's no evidence that Tang poetic manuscripts ever acknowledge or attempt to address the existence of different versions of the works they record. The poems were there to be read and enjoyed in the Tang, not examined as objects of textual criticism as they would be in the Song when we start to have things like this. It's almost a cliche in studies of European manuscript culture to claim that printing quote unquote sets texts while well, manuscripts are in a constant state of fluid change. In a sense, this is true in the present case. The Song edition notes variants, but it does choose between them. It declares which version will be made official. In this case, um, 
in this case, the modern type versions of Bring in the Ale follow the decisions of the Sung edition almost to the character. Yet, the notes that one version has can also be seen as ultimately destabilizing in a way the Tang manuscripts were not. The latter never admitted to variation, even if contemporary poets and their readers were well aware that this phenomenon existed. To experience the variation in Tang poetic text during the Tang itself, a reader would have had to have had multiple copies of a single poem. Now, some readers clearly did, but it's also likely that because of the greater effort and often expense involved in manuscript reproduction, most readers would not. With the introduction in the Song of annotations indicating variants, a single document could essentially contain numerous different potential texts of a given poem in compact form. This type of presentation makes the reader constantly aware that other possibilities exist. They're tantalizing reminders that this poem is, in a certain way, many other poems. But these possibilities are always just that. They're never whole poems, but only fragments. We're not told their sources. Of the 11 variants noted in the Song edition of Bring in the Ale, only three appear in the Dunhuang versions of the poem. This leaves open the possibility that there are many other versions of the poem that we'll never see. Song editors hedge their bets in a manner that both authorize certain versions of the poem while simultaneously undermining those same versions. They preserved fragments of a manuscript world that was being eclipsed, but was still very much alive for them, while displaying an editorial and critical ethos that was substantially different from that earlier world's set of ideas about texts and how we interact with them. The poetic work Bring in the Ale has existed in a state of constant flux from the time that Levi first composed it. We are in the present day in the midst of destabilizing changes in the way we relate to the written word. The movement of words from paper to screen may not seem significant at first, but when this is combined with the seemingly infinite possibilities presented by hypertexts and the like, it's clear that we're entering a new era of interacting not only with new literary works, but with much older ones as well. Yet radical as these changes may be, the problems of interpretation they present are ones that have, in some form or another, existed all along. Confronting the multitude of meanings already embedded in different documents and texts from the Tang and later may undermine certain critical approaches to Tang poetry, but it will simultaneously open up new avenues of inquiry that may indeed help us understand how readers in earlier periods experienced this poetry themselves. Thank you.